Hello, I'm Pastor Brian, and I want to thank you so much for joining me as we look into God's Word to see His timeless truth. Nobody likes being wrong, or nobody likes um, the the punishments that comes from wrong. Well, maybe we do a little bit, but at the moment we don't. Maybe we can see where we can grow and mature from that. But at the moment, really, we don't like being or our, our sins or the wrong things with, that we do to be exposed. I mean, just look at a child who says, no, I didn't take the cookies from the cookie jar or eat the ice cream with their mouth covered with chocolate all over their face or ice cream. It, obviously, they did do it. They don't want to be caught doing wrong. And, and truthfully, a lot of us would rather blame the other person than to accept our own responsibility for the wrong things that we've done. Ultimately, we deep down know that we're not perfect. At least hopefully you know you're not perfect. Um, and, and Paul is really addressing the issue to the Roman church, and he's been focusing on the non-Jews and the Jews for the very point that they need to see that God is righteous and holy and his judgments are right. And when we don't hold up to any part of that, that God is right in exercising his wrath, his judgment upon individuals whether Jew or Gentile. And so here we have it in, in this passage. But before we dig in any further, let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer, just asking for him to just help us to understand really the need we have for him and what he has done on the cross. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to say and those that are listening ears to hear what is truly in your word. Lord, that we would see the deep truths of scripture, that we would be changed, we would be transformed, and that we would be able to communicate the truths of scripture to others. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 5. Now, Paul has been going through making an argument. First, he goes ahead and says, you know what, Gentiles, you are guilty of sin. And, and all of creation even gives indication of that. And it shows that you're guilty of sin. But he doesn't show them that just showing them they're guilty of sin makes them righteous. It, it, it provides benefit to them, but not salvific benefit. And then he says, you know what? Because of creation, you can see that there is a God, and, and that is a benefit to you. And for Jews, you have had the law, and the law was there for the purpose of showing that you can't measure up to the law, that you are sinners, that you can't fulfill it. And to keep in mind that there is the idea of, you know, act of rebellion against God as far as um, choosing to murder or to steal or to lie. But then there is that passive indifference, choosing not to follow after God. Whichever way it may be, I think if somebody is honest with themselves, they realize that they have gone against God. They have fallen at any one point. And at any point of, of, of failure, what we rightly deserve is God's wrath being poured out upon us. Ultimately, because of Adam and Eve and that sin nature that has been passed down, we are guilty. But even if that were not the case, we are guilty of sin. So let's go ahead and dig right in to Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 5. It says this, But if our unrighteousness serves, serves to show uh, the righteousness of God, what shall we say? So Paul is continuing on kind of this dialogue with this uh, individual, this perceived Jewish individual. Uh, it's not a real conversation, but he's assuming the arguments that they would make to his um, statements that he's writing down and how he's clarifying who Jesus is, who God is, and, and how we are sinners. And so he says, all right, here, here's an unrighteous person, and God is righteous. And the question kind of is this, that God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us. And it continues on. It says, I am speaking in a human way. 
And so what he's saying is, this is just a human example. I, th this, this really holds no weight, but let me address it from you from the perspective of somebody who does not know the Lord in, in the flesh, kind of who, who is against God. They're, what, they're, what they're saying is, God has no ability to judge any of us because none of us can make ourselves righteous because the law and it had benefit and the benefit that the law had that we saw in Romans 3 uh, 1 was that it, it was true it pointed out that they were sinners just as creation for non-Jews show that they're they're guilty and, and it, but it does show that uh, there is a God so it is of benefit in that manner but not of salvific not of being able to be saved from sin it's just pointing out that we do have sin and they're saying but God has no ability to ju to to judge because um he's going to go ahead and 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 really accuse those individuals of sin um because it shows the righteousness of God. And, and he really is, responds to this in, in a harsh manner. He said, by no means. So that argument falls flat. It, it does not mean that. For then how could God judge the world? He's saying if, if the world has fallen short, if, if we go with your assumption, then God has no ability to judge the world, and he does. But if through my lie God truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? So you know, the person saying, all right, when I do wrong, and I know that God judges rightly, isn't that righteous judgment of God showing the glory of God? So why can I still be a sinner? And, and, and this is just faulty thinking on their point. But in reality, that's what we, we kind of do. All right, at least I'm better than that guy. A lot of people in life, when they don't understand the scripture and they're thinking from a human perspective of why should they be allowed into heaven, a lot of times it centers on the fact that, well, I'm better than that individual, or I've done these things, or at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so, or I've done okay, but that's not the standard. The standard is perfect holiness, perfect righteousness, living and not faltering at any one point or any one time. And so that's what's coming through. And it says, it continues on, it says, this. It says, and why not do evil that good may come? Really, this does not make sense. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and carry out evil so that God's righteousness can be shown. Therefore, there's really no need to punish me. It says as, as a person reasoning why they shouldn't have to pay for their crime. It, a righteous judge would not just overlook that. The, because of the there is a consequence to sin and going against God, God has to exercise his judgment upon them. And the people are just making the arguments, well, that's not right uh, with what you're saying, because they didn't see it that way, especially as uh, Jews, as they grow up, they, they were very self-righteous individuals. And they thought, all right, we're God's chosen people. We have special privileges. Therefore, we're better than others and really can't just by what we've done be good enough. And I think that's what a lot of people like to do. A lot of people like to set their own standard and say, all right, if I meet this mark, then I should be allowed into heaven. Well, even just as I've talked about even last week was the very fact that we don't get to set the standards. We don't. We don't get to make the rules. God does. And if we falter in any part, we're guilty. And even if we didn't falter in any part, we have been separated from God since Adam and Eve in the garden. And so he goes ahead and he says this. Uh, as some people... 
a slanderously charged as saying. So it's like, this is what people around are saying that I'm communicating. This isn't right. This isn't, this is of error. And so Paul's going to go ahead and it, just as he's doing here, he's correcting maybe the wrong assumptions. And, and that happens in life. I mean, I know that I've communicated biblical truth and maybe somebody walks away and, and they take away the wrong point. He's like, well, you don't quite get it, do you? And, and so he's like, let me clarify things. And so for a Jewish audience, what better place for Paul to go in, than to the Old Testament, showing that God is consistent, that he has always looked at the issue of the law and the issue of sin as showing us that we can't do it in and of ourselves, that we are sinners. Uh their uh, condemnation is just. He's saying all are condemned, all deserve this. And, and, and so he goes ahead and then jumps right into it. And this is probably one of those important verses to understand. And Paul doesn't mix his words. He says this, What then, are Jews are better off? No, no, not at all. And so what he's doing, remember back in uh, 3.1, he said, yes, there is benefit, but not salvific benefit, not that it saves you, but as Jewish individuals, you have knowledge of the law of God through uh, the Torah and through the other uh, Old Testament books. But you have knowledge of it, but that just shows that you haven't met those standards. So, and in fact, it is a benefit to, but regardless, all are guilty of sin and all have to deal with this sin issue. There's no one that gets a pass on it. It says this, For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Gentiles, are under sin. So, He's saying all people have this issue of sin that has to be dealt with because what they rightly deserve is God's wrath being poured out upon them. Now, this is not a popular thing in today's culture and society. I don't know if it ever really has been popular, but the whole issue of that we're guilty of sin and God should rightly exercise his judgment upon us is not winning any popularity contest to hold it, but It doesn't matter because God sets the standard and all of us have this issue of sin. Remember, Paul wants everyone to see that they have this sin issue that Jesus Christ has dealt with and they can't overlook it. They can't have done it through religious merits or any other means. And so he says they're not better off at all. Both Jews and Gentiles are guilty. And it says, as it is written. And so he's taking uh, several different passages from the Old Testament. And remember, when he quotes the Old Testament, a lot of times, not only is he referring back to what the Old Testament says, but he also gives insight as to maybe what the psalmist or what the author of, of that was writing. So further down, kind of giving insight to that. It says, no one is righteous. No, not one. And so he's pulling from Psalm 14.1 and Ecclesiastes 7.20. And I think this is important to understand. No one is righteous, not one. There is not one person righteous in and of themselves. That is clear. That is perfectly clear. When he says no one, it means no one. So we are in that position before Christ, before trusting in Christ. Everybody is in that position. No one understands. So he's going to get further on that it's through the preaching of God's word that we must communicate God's standard. It says, no one seeks for God. So in and of themselves, it is God who draws them to himself. But in and of ourselves, people don't seek God. People rather would make themselves God and seek pleasure for themselves instead of seeking God. And this kind of, we get this idea as it continues on uh, from Psalm 53 three two. Uh, it says this, um, All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. And so if you look at Psalm 14.1, 
And Psalm 53, 2 is kind of where that last one is coming from. If you look at it, it, it refers at the very end of the Psalm that salvation comes from Zion. So even in the Old Testament, and it's saying that pointing to the fact that there, that there is Jesus who is coming on the, on the scene and he will be the one who provides opportunity for salvation. The Old Testament never promises that somebody could be made right through the law. So he's, he's bringing that out and just even showing us kind of that there was a plan that God had from the Old Testament. God isn't a different God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. His message is clear and it coincides together. And they have to understand that people turn away from God. That is the human heart is that at the root of it, people turn away from God. And in that, um, the, it does not provide salvation. And, and then uh, Psalm 14, uh, 2 and 3, can we look at 14, 1? So it continues on and it says this, No one does good, not even one. Now, we can see that. We can look around the world around us and see all the evil and all the sin that goes on. See, before knowing Christ, we don't have freedom. The only thing that we do know is the ability to rebel against God, the only to sin, to go against God. And so no one does good. No one seeks it in and of themselves. So he's getting to the sinfulness of humanity, all humanity, whether Jew or Gentile. Says this, it says, uh, verse 13, their throats is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. And so what, what he's kind of getting at is kind of what it talks about in Psalm 5, five 9, that their throats are open graves, that, that there's death. I think what he's portraying to is earlier what we saw in um in chapter 3 was the whole idea that God is truth and everyone else is a liar. And he's pointing out the truthfulness of God and that truth is in him. And it continues on. And it says, uh, their tongues deceive. Uh, the, ven- the venom of asp is, uh, is under their lips. So it's, you know, the idea of a snake. He, and this is from Psalm 114 verse 3. And it's just pointing out that throughout Scripture, it is pointing to the fallenness of man, the issue of man being in sin. Uh, Verse 14, uh, their mouths is full of curses and bitterness. And that is getting from Psalm 10, 7. So he's just bringing just this litany of Old Testament passages showing that even the Old Testament shows that you weren't justifying the law. You have this issue of sin. And it continues on. As we saw that it's showing of God's truthfulness and in, in humanity and that, that their lies and, and that which they speak, that which comes forth from them uh, is evil. And not only that, they go headlong into evil. And that's what we'll see with this idea of running to or going towards evil. So it comes from them. They seek it. They pursue it. Uh, there's no one righteous. And that's just, he's just pounding that through again and again and again. Um, their feet are swift to shed blood. Uh, in their paths, they, their paths are ruin and misery. So they, not only do they, are they deceitful, they cause other people harm. And don't we know that when we see individuals in their sin, as they cause others harm, great harm. And they, the way of peace, they have not known. So this is coming from Isaiah uh, uh, 59, 20, that they don't know of the peace of God. They, they seek to destroy, they keep, seek evil things. And so it's just showing from the Old Testament that you know, these Jewish people that think they're righteous, that think they're good because they're God's chosen people, he's saying, no, have you not read the scriptures? This is what it says. And he boils it down to this. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I think that's what we have the problem with, not only back then, but in today's culture. 
people don't fear God. They want to live their own lives. They want to set their own standard. They would rather follow after their own things or after things of Satan than follow after God. And remember, even uh, as, as we can recall in Revelation 14, 7, it says, fear God and give glory to him. Well, He's saying that people don't do this. This is not the position that they're at. Their position is that they're liars, they're they're deceivers, that that evilness comes from their mouth, that they speak, and and that's really what's within them. Their their words are evil. And not only that, they pursue evil. Their their feet go towards evil. And so with that, he just kind of sums up the attitude of the heart. They don't fear God. And he goes in and in 1920 summarizes it. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So he's again addressing Jews and kind of the the Mosaic law. So it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. He said, all right, you have to give an account. You don't escape the, 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 what God has set forth. God is holy and righteous, and, and we have to give an account for our sins uh, that we have done. And he says, it doesn't matter uh, if you're a Jew, you're still guilty. It, 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 again, it doesn't matter what physical things you have done. You are guilty of sin. And, and and he'll talk about the purpose of the law. And so, and, and that everybody's going to be held accountable to him. It doesn't matter. You don't get a mulligan. It, it's this example. There was an individual flying in an airplane, and he looks at two bags on the ground. One is a parachute and one is a bag of cement, grabbing and holding on to the bag of cement, thinking that it will provide safety for him, and it does not. It provides certain death for him. And so what he's saying is what you're relying upon does not provide salvation. It just shows you if you're holding on to that bag of cement that you're just going down like a like a like a rock you're 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 headed for certain destruction and so um, it doesn't matter if in your mind you think uh, you can make the rules of how to enter into heaven you don't get to make those rules the law is there for this purpose it says this for by the works of the law no human uh being will be justified in his sight The law doesn't save anyone. The law was there to show us, show them that they were sinners. And so whether Jew or Gentile, all are guilty of sin. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So he's saying that whether creation, whether our our own human conscience, or whether the law, all of it points to this issue that we have a sin problem. Now, he doesn't get into the solution, the, the, the resolve that there is salvation found in Christ. He's going to get there. But to, for, he's realizing that he can, before he goes ahead and says, you know what? Salvation is in Christ. People go, why do I have need for that? I, I'm not guilty of anything. Why do I need to be saved? And it's kind of you until you realize your position, until you realize you're drowning, you're not going to call uh, to for a lifeguard or a life raft or or anything. But first, you need to realize your current condition is that of being separated from God. And you can't you don't choose to know him. All are in this position and all choose to go down the path of wickedness. And what is rightly deserved is God's wrath. And and so he is building upon the fact that we do need Jesus Christ. Hopefully, if you're listening to me today, you have found out that you do need Jesus Christ and that you do need to place your faith in him. You do need to trust in him. You can't do it on your word works. You can't define God the way you want to define God. God has given us scriptures to show us what we need to do, that salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone. I want to encourage you, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, that you would 
see the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. He, he was sinless, and yet he died to be your substitute. He died to take your place so that you could have life in him, that you could have salvation. I just want to encourage you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ if you haven't. Cry out to him. Because the natural position is for all of us to go, Hey, not me. I, 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 I'm not really that bad. But that's not what the truth is. The truth is uh, communicated here by, by God through Paul. All of us would rather lie to ourselves and think, think we're not that bad. But the certainty for that is destruction. And so I want to encourage you to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work he's done. Let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer, just asking God and thanking God for the great salvation that he has provided for us, even in the midst of us being sinners. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, I pray that we would turn to you, we would trust in you, because we all realize, Lord, that we are sinners, and what we do deserve is your wrath being poured out upon us. Help us to live for you. Lord, just work in us and through us, Lord. We trust in you. We believe in you. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. If you have any questions, reach out to me and be blessed.